It's difficult to imagine what it would have been like to see the moving pictures for the first time. Unsurprisingly, the futuristic medium electrified the world. Subjects of the Russian Empire quickly grew fond of cinema, but as Russia had no film industry of its own, people enjoyed foreign films from places like France and the United States. That is, until a couple of pioneers decided to change that. Alexander Drankov opened an atelier, or a studio, and hired director Vladimir Romashkov to create the first Russian film. Stenko Razin was the result of their collaboration. The film's plot came from a legend associated with the 17th century Cossack rebel and immortalized in the song of the same name. Leading a fleet of Cossack boats, Stenko Razin captured a Persian princess. However, his men are concerned that the princess distracted him from the rebellion and trick him into thinking she cheated on him. The furious Cossack throws the princess overboard as the film cuts to black and ends. The short was far from perfect. It was only about 8 minutes long and consisted of a handful of white shots. And its actors, if they could be called such, were barely visible. Still, it was the beginning of something much bigger. Many more short films followed. A couple years later, a man by the name of Alexander Hanjonkov opened one of the more prolific film studios of the time. Vasily Goncharov, the screenwriter of Stenka, approached Hanjonkov with the idea to make a detailed film about the Crimean War. Hanjonkov was doubtful that such an ambitious project was possible, but changed his mind when Goncharov received support of the Russian government. Emperor Nicholas II requested a historically accurate film about the war and provided access to researchers, along with a large budget. Defense of Sevastopol was Russia's first feature-length film. A retelling of significant events from the Crimean War, the film was a grandiose war epic. Instead of a continuous narrative, the film is split into documentary-style segments. The film's massive production values are obvious. The battles are recreated using hundreds of people and copious use of pyrotechnics. The scenes are diverse, showing different aspects of the war. From planning meetings and defense preparations, to mass charges and triage points. That said, many of the scenes show a level of amateurism, and the battles tend to look awkward and unconvincing. The film makes up for its crudeness with the ending. Instead of clumsy reenactments, it shows the actual Crimean War veterans. The final montage features old men and women from France, Britain and Russia as they look into the camera, punctuating the film with emotion. The nascent industry gave birth to its first film stars. Rising prominently among them was Ivan Mozhukhin. After a small role in the defense of Sevastopol, he made himself known in the 1913 comedy The Little House in Kolomna. A young woman tricks her strict mother into hiring her beloved army officer, who is disguised as a housemaid. Unfortunately, the officer does not make a good cook or a convincing lady. This adaptation of Alexander Pushkin's poem is a typical example of contemporary filmmaking. Little more than a stage play and film, it was made with a static camera and minimal editing. The Night Before Christmas was a much more elaborate film, full of special effects. Vladislav Starevich, a famous early animator, adapted this classic fairy tale by Nikolai Gogol. A witch and her demon familiar cast a Ukrainian village into darkness by stealing the moon from the sky. In the meantime, the local smith is trying to get the attention of the beautiful Oksana, who rejects his advances, jokingly asking him to bring her the queen's shoes. The smith is distraught 
until he captures the demon and forces him to help out. The film showcases Gogol's signature combination of traditional Ukrainian culture and quirky supernatural characters. Ivan Mazhukin was particularly memorable as the mischievous demon. Classic literature proved popular in early Russian films. Queen of Spades, based on another story by Alexander Pushkin, was masterfully directed by rising filmmaker Yakov Portazanov. Herman, a young gambler played by Mozhukin, overhears a story of a young noblewoman who was able to win any card game. Obsessed with the story, Herman confronts the woman, now an old lady, but she dies before he is able to learn the secret. The afterlife can't stop her, however, and the woman returns to haunt Herman. Protozanov used several innovative filming techniques, such as match cuts, split screens, and dolly shots to underscore this dark tale. While the film industry thrived, things were not going well for the rest of the country. Russia's participation in the World War turned into an embarrassing failure. Emperor Nicholas II, whose reign was already marred by a series of tragedies, was highly unpopular, and there were rumors of a coming revolution. Comedies and fantasy tales made way for tragic stories of unhappy relationships and broken hearts. Vera Holodnaya was perfect for such tragic roles. An inexperienced young actress with minimal training, she charmed moviegoers for reasons few were able to explain. Of the 40-something films she was in, only a few survived. A Life for a Life was a breakthrough for Holodnaya, in which her role as one of the two clashing sisters paralleled behind-the-scenes rivalry with her co-star, the classically trained Lydia Korineva. Holodnaya's Nata is in love with an aristocrat who marries her sister Musia for the money. Nata marries a caring businessman, but lives an unhappy life. Meanwhile, the aristocrat gambles the dowry money away and continues a secret relationship with Nata. The sister's mother comes up with a solution, and it is not a pleasant one. Although Holodnaya's acting was judged subpar by the critics, she quickly surpassed her experienced co-star in popularity. The viewers enjoyed watching stories with an aristocratic setting, and the director Yevgeny Bauer was known for his attention to lavish, decadent sets. The Dying Swan is a somber tale of a ballet dancer looking for love. Gisela, played by professional dancer Vera Karali, is a skilled but mute ballerina. A man shows interest and takes her on a date, only to leave her for another, breaking Gisela's heart. During a performance in her signature role, she catches the attention of an eccentric artist obsessed with death. The artist persuades Gisela to pose for a painting. However, the artist becomes furious when Gisela finds her true love, and her eyes are no longer filled with sadness. The tragic plot contrasts with the film's backdrop, a relaxing seaside resort. Pyotr Chardinin's drama, Be Silent, My Sorrow, Be Silent, is in many ways similar to Bauer's A Life for a Life. Vera Holodnaya stars as Paola, an impoverished circus artist married to a heavily drinking colleague. Paola leaves her husband for a businessman who has plenty of money but treats Paola like property. Distraught, she tries to find happiness with another man, but he turns out to be a hopeless gambler. The film was released in two parts. Unfortunately, the second half of the film, titled The Tale of Dear Love, did not survive, and the existing film ends with an unresolved plot. The contemporary reviews describe the remainder of the story, and it's not cheerful. Paola wanders from one man to another, growing more and more depressed, never finding her true love.
Vladimir Mayakovsky was widely known as a notorious and controversial poet, but he also tried himself as an actor and a screenwriter. Together with director Yevgeny Slavinsky, he made The Lady and the Hooligan. Filmed after the October Revolution, this picture moved away from portraying members of high society and centered on ordinary citizens. A young school teacher teaches a class of unruly adults in a small town. A street thug, played by Mayakovsky, falls in love with her, but she rejects his advances. When one of the students offends the teacher, the hooligan steps in to defend her against a dangerous crowd. The thug struggles with his chaotic nature to show his affection, and eventually the teacher becomes conflicted as well. As the moviegoers watched tragic stories on the silver screen, the country was quickly falling apart. Disastrous losses in the World War led to unrest, culminating in two revolutions and the removal of the emperor. With the country engaged in a civil war, Yakov Protasanov took advantage of the turmoil by making a film likely not allowed by either government. Father Sergius, based on a Leo Tolstoy novel, stars Ivan Mozhukhin as Prince Kasatsky. Kasatsky, a recently graduated officer, courts a young woman with the intention to marry. When he finds out that the woman is a mistress of the Tsar, Kasatsky becomes a monk and takes on a new clerical name. Unable to forget his previous life, he becomes a hermit. Women desperately try to seduce him, but Sergius proves stronger. His fame grows and he becomes known as a holy healer. Continuing to run from temptations, the aged Sergius wanders the earth without a home. An old man who could no longer be himself, nor anyone but himself, Father Sergius was a fitting epilogue for Russian monarchy. The new Bolshevik government executed the royal family and clashed with various opposing forces, plunging the country into a bloody civil war. Film production came to a near complete halt. Many from the film industry fled overseas. Mozhukin left to work in Europe and the United States with mild success. Protasanov left with him but would return after the war. Starevich opened an animation studio in Paris. Some were less fortunate. Evgeny Bauer died of pneumonia and Vera Halodna perished during the flu epidemic. In just 10 years, Russian cinema graduated from short amateur productions to feature-length literary drama with world-class acting and editing. The stars and filmmakers of Imperial Russia built a foundation, and with the revolution as the catalyst, the Soviet cinema would soon produce some of the most innovative works the world had ever seen. <laughs> 